is the you know making sorry go ahead it's okay it is making sure of course that you know it that you you understand what the, the the thought process is behind what you're doing you know if we have these different parties and, and the parties don't really want to sell it they're just trying to assign value that's one thing but if the ultimate goal is for one of those parties to actually to to you know create cash out of their position then that's going to be critical to know too you know a, you know as troy pointed out in the you know in the partition of real property act you know that can have a large effect on who gets to buy out and at what price they get to buy so even before you talk about moving forward to an appraisal or, or any of that, you need to understand exactly what the end goal is of what you're trying to accomplish. So then you can figure out which way is going to be best to approach it. You know, I, historically, there has been the stigma behind, you know, professionals like us who, who go in and sell these properties that we're just looking to, to get them sold and the value doesn't matter. And, you know, you're going to get liquidation prices. Um, and I think that it's important that that we you know let people know that that's actually not true. You know that the work that we do is to to develop the best possible price for these assets. You know we are fiduciaries and we have a requirement that we get the maximum value for these items. So I would argue that actually in in these instances that usually we get a better price than others get because of the process that we go through in order to to make that sale happen. You know, so we are making sure that, you know, all the, the appropriate parties are able to see that it is a fair and open sale. You know, we have rules and requirements regarding publication and some of those things, uh, you know, related to making sure that we are getting out to the target market. We're not just doing an auction on the courthouse steps. You know, we, we are looking to maximize these values. And so that's one thing that I really want to point out is that, you know, that reputation of, of the fire sale, you know, with the, the professionals is just not true anymore. And that, uh, and that really that you know this is an opportunity to get maximum value and at the same price, at the same time try to accomplish the goal that you're trying to you know accomplish in you know in the real uh, in your in your case. Um, Troy, before you you um, chime in again, one thing I wanted to say uh, for those of you following along the presentation, when it comes to hiring an appraiser, the credentials are very important. Most of you probably don't know appraisal appraiser uh, credentials, and you want to ask the appraiser about their credentialing, um, number one. And there's a, a varying degree of valuation credentials for, depending on the type of assets that are appraised, if we're speaking about real property, there's four major designations in the United States that are, that are used. Um, all, all of our appraisers in our organization have one, maybe two, or even three of the four credentials. Um, uh, and, then, and then also uh, understand if you believe this is going to go to court, does that appraiser have testimony and best deposition experience? Oh my gosh. You can get a brilliant appraiser appraising, but they couldn't speak in court. They won't help your case. Troy being the expert about that, Jeff as well. You know, uh, they, they, they may know how to run the numbers, but they, they couldn't speak about it, you know, if, if, if there was the last thing on the earth they had to do. So asking about their credentials for testimony is important. The other thing I want to touch on, if you look at your, your the presentation about non-partitioning party can opt out, opt to buy out partitioning party at a pro rata value without discount. Um, the discounting valuation side is always a question. Uh, we had this post this last Friday uh, where a client says, well, they're going to buy out their 25% interest. They're a 75% holder in a $110 million apartment complex. And they said, well, we want a discount valuation. And I said, well, for what reason? Well, because we're going to buy out the other party. I said, well, once they buy out the other party, you're going to have 100% interest. You're going to control, you already control it, but you're going to have, there will be no, no other parties involved, right? Partners. So I said, how could there, there can't be a discount that would apply? And we went back and forth for about a half an hour. And I said, quite frankly, it, 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 it's illogical for a discount to apply. Even if that's, you're trying to buy the property cheap, we understand that. So it was an interesting conversation, and this was with a lawyer who absolutely felt that a discount should apply. Troy, you 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 have any thoughts about that and discounts on partition for your perspective? 
Well, you know, for at, at this point, discounts are not an issue in the uh, Partition of Real Property Act because you don't get them. And I know how much appraisers love to uh, do those calculations for discounts, but this takes that completely out of uh, the, the, the question you're going to get. So basically, the process is the court appoints a, an, uh, um, an appraiser, and getting back to the point of how important it is to get a good appraiser, uh, after the appraiser is appointed, there will be a hearing 30 or so days down the road in which the court will determine the value. You will be entitled to present your own evidence of value and bring in your own appraiser if you disregard if, or if you disagree with that appraiser. But that appraiser that's been appointed by the court is either selected by the court or has been selected by the parties. So you're going to have a really uphill battle in challenging what that value is. Once the value is established, then it's just a very fair process. It's the non-partitioning party. So the party that doesn't want the property to be sold, they have the opportunity to buy the partitioning property, uh, partitioning owner's uh, interest for just a pro rata percentage value of, of the appraised value. So if a property appraises at a um, million dollars, there are three uh, tenants in common who own e equal ownership. Um, the price is going to be three hundred and thirty-three thousand dollars and thirty-three cents. Uh, um, then three hundred. You get the point. It's going to be one third of that. I'm not a mathematician, um, and so it's it, it creates this very, I think, fair way of doing it without there being any additional litigation regarding. Well, did you give too much of a a lack of control discount or uh, uh, a minority discount on that. Was it too generous? Was it not enough? That issue is taken out of the question. So it's a much, much simpler process. The non-partitioning party will have a certain amount of time to come up with the cash. And if they don't come up with the cash, then the property will either be partitioned in kind, uh, and there's a preference for partitioning in kind if it is possible. But when you're talking about a single family house, uh, you cannot partition, you cannot subdivide a single family house. Uh, and so then there will be a sale on the market the parties will agree upon or submit names for brokers. Um, and the rules for the sale is that, are that it will get listed at the appraised value. It can sell above without there being any further court action. If you have to sell it because nobody is offering the appraised value, then you have to go back into court and get permission to sell it uh, um, for below that appraised value. So just in, to sum up, the Partition of Real Property Act is intended to make the partitioning process fairer to all the parties to guarantee that the partitioning party does receive a fair value and it facilitates a purchase of that interest for a fair value. So th thank you, Troy. So Jeff, um, you being the partition referee or the appointed party that hires somebody like our companies to either appraise or sell the, 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 the real estate, um, there's always a question that we're, we're posed with, um, which is brokerage v. auction, or which is a better approach to sale uh, or in certain partition sales that we've been involved with, it may be sequential. So I just like your take for the audience. Um, do you do you have uh, do you have a, a a a let's say a a favorite between brokerage or auction, or is there a such that you know uh, one process seems to solve a problem better than the other? You you tell me. I'm just curious. You know, that's an interesting question, and it's one that we always deal with whenever we, we uh, you know, are in a situation where we need to sell a property. And, and what I would say is it's going to depend on the type of property that it is that you're looking to sell, what, you know, what you know about it, what you don't know about it, because certain properties are going to be more, uh, you're going to be able to maximize value better through a brokerage sale, you know, especially if it's a known marketplace. You know, we, we have a business we're preparing to sell now that deals in uh, electromagnetic testing. It's a very specific market. There's not a lot of people that do it. So doing an auction in a situation like that may not be the best possible outcome because we already know who the potential buyers are in that marketplace. And so we you know, might be able to use that knowledge to be able to leverage a better deal. 
Uh, whereas sometimes you end up in situations where you have properties, let's say, you know, in the middle of nowhere, uh, in the middle of the desert, and you have multiple properties out there, you know, you own, you know, a, a large percentage of the property that's even available, and it's not an area that's really highly desirable for development, uh, let alone, uh, you know, uh, maximizing profits. So, you know, what I would say is that when, you, when you're looking at doing this process, you should hire a firm that's capable of doing both. Because as you get into it and as there, you, you learn more information from that company, uh, it will help lead you to the direction that's going to be the best possible you know, outcome for that. And, and, and like I said, it, depending on the property and some of the specifics surrounding it, 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 you know, it will change. And, and, we'll, and so I would say that as I do these, I do both and I do them both pretty regularly. I don't think that there is a right way and a wrong way to do it. I just think that it depends a lot on the variables and what you know about the marketplace, what you know about your buyers and your sellers, and, and that's going to change a lot. And, and so I think what you do is you you get as much information you, as you can, and that's where hiring the brokerage and the, the auction you know company that can do both will, will benefit you the most because they're going to be able to give you the, all the information that you're going to need to make a decision you know, and an accurate decision. Because ultimately, you know, when we do these jobs, we're judged on how much money we're bringing back to the estate. You know, for these sales, and so hiring a good professional that's going to assist in that process and, and assist in the maximizing that value is just going to make you look better. So find the company that's going to be able to do it, do it right. You don't want to have to go and get a second party or a third party engaged by the court because you you hired a company that's only able to do a small percentage of what it is you need done. So going out there, finding that right company, you know, figuring out what the best way to move forward is, and then developing the plan for doing that. So if we're going to do a, a you know brokerage type sale first, what if we don't get the offers that we need or that we're expecting? You know, what is the backup plan? Do we have an overbid process in place? You know, and, and what does that look like? You know, what percentage are we going to require as an overbid? You know, how is that process then tailored out? And so getting involved with a company that's done these multiple times will make your life significantly easier. You know, I've had the the fortune of, of being able to do a lot of these different processes, and and I've worked with Todd, and I've worked with other firms, and you know, from my perspective, you know, Todd, Todd's firm knows what they're doing and, and they're easy to work with. And that's why we do a lot of work with them across the country. Uh, but hiring that firm is going to be a, be that full service firm for you to get you everything you need and then getting that information that you need to make that decision and then presenting a good cohesive plan to the court uh, is going to be critical in that because, you know, people are always going to question what it is you're doing. Uh, that, you know, that's the unique position about being a fiduciary, right? No matter what you do, somebody thinks you're right and somebody thinks you're wrong. Um, if you're lucky, sometimes they both think you're wrong. Uh, and so then you, you know, you need to make sure that you understand exactly what it is you're doing and being able to, to be able to, you know, reiterate that to the court and to the parties in order to prevent litigation where possible and where not possible, you know, being able to convince the judge that what you're doing is the right approach and, and the right way to do these things. You know, uh, thank you, Jeff. And Troy, before we get to the next type of medical, one thing I'd like to add about this, I mean, it's just all fresh in my mind because we've got so many different types of sales we're doing. Right now, uh, literally as we speak, we're 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 selling a, a small two duplexes and fourplexes. And for those of you who are in the real estate market currently or on a regular basis, you're you're you understand the trials and tribulations that we're seeing in the market with the difficulty of financing, especially commercial real estate. Um, single family residential is still pretty fluid, but of course costs have gone up. But in the commercial world, it's becoming, uh, or multifamily world, it's becoming a little bit more challenging. And of course, interest rates have over doubled. Long story short, we, we're having a heck of a time with unsophisticated buyers buying duplexes, fourplexes, threeplexes, triplexes, and going into escrow, then falling out of escrow, going back into escrow, falling out of escrow. Why? Well, their lender, they didn't like this. They wanted to get an appraisal. The appraisal didn't appraise. The inspection came up problematic. Uh, there was water damage. I mean, I could go through the litany of all this, but the point I'm, I'm trying to make is, is that what we're seeing right now is, is um, and some of this is cyclical in our business because we act as both brokers and, as Jeff said, as auction specialists. Uh, so in the auction uh, process, it's a very straightforward uh, process from a time, a, a qualification perspective, an inspection perspective. Everything is very much laid out and it's very much date certain. The date is here. It starts here and it ends here. It's, it's within a time frame. 
In a brokered sale, you can go in and out of escrow many times. And we're dealing with that with multiple properties right now. And in one case of, of, of a sale for an estate we're doing, we have some very unhappy and very frustrated beneficiaries and par parties involved because uh, it's, it's, it's the marketplace and uh, the lenders. And again, the buyers are in control, not the sellers. So sometimes an auction could be not an approach to, uh, as some of you might think, that it's going to find an under market value. And that's not the case at all. I will tell you, in some cases, auctions uh, actually achieve a better price through competition than a brokered sale can because of the structure of the sale process. Um, it's a question of analyzing the asset and the buyer pool. Uh, but I really, I, I want you, all of you to understand that there's, you know, we don't advocate one process is better or worse than the other. They're both very different. You just have to know how to use them. And as it, you know, in the case of partition, you can see you have many options. So Troy, let's go to hypothetical. Well, we're calling it number three in this case, if you like. Um, uh, Troy, you want to read it off? I'll let you start. You're on mute, Troy. I knew I was going to do that. Um, Sally created a trust and transferred her substantial fortune into it. The trust provides that after Sally's death, the income is to be paid to her second husband, Dave. Dave, as the successor trustee, had the discretion to invade principal for the purpose of health, education, maintenance, and welfare. He also had the power of appointment. If Dave did not exercise the power of appointment, the assets were to be distributed to Sally's four children from her first marriage and one child from her second marriage. If any of Sally's children predeceased Dave, then their issue would take decedent, uh, decedent's child's share. After Sally dies, three of her children bring suit against Dave, claiming that he is abusing his discretion to invade the principal. The court appoints a professional fiduciary as the, a temporary trustee. The other child, Bruce, does not participate in the lawsuit. The parties to the lawsuit go to a mediation and settle. As part of the settlement, the three beneficiaries waive any interest they have in Sally's trust in exchange for a large distribution. After the settlement is approved by the court, Bruce dies. Dave then dies without executing his power of appointment. 30 years later, Bruce's daughter, Diane, brings a claim that the settlement agreement is invalid because she, as a contingent remainder beneficiary, was not given notice of the lawsuit nor the mediation. Did Diane have the right to notice of the lawsuit and the mediation, despite the fact that she was only a contingent remainderman um, and not receiving current income? And is the settlement agreement still valid and enforceable against Diane? Now, that's a long hypothetical, but these are the exact facts of a case that came out a few years ago called Roth v. Jelly. And this is the stuff of nightmares for attorneys and for beneficiaries, because the court ruled that even a contingent remainder beneficiary, and what I mean by contingent remainder beneficiary is if in that scenario, Dave had exercised his power of appointment and disinherited that particular uh, um, child, then the interest would have evaporated. In that case, Dave did not do that. Um, so there's a question, and it's always been a question, do, are we required to give notice of a mediation, required to give notice of a settlement of a claim to uh, parties who are not receiving current income? In this case, the court said, yes, they are entitled under the constitution to due process of law, which means that they were entitled to notice and the ability to be heard that a, even a contingent remainder interest is a current interest, which is entitled to notice. And the court of appeal sent this case back to the trial court to figure out how do you undo 30 years of distributions. Properties had been distributed out of this trust. Those properties had been sold, the proceeds invested. And that trial court now has to figure out how do you trace that money back to make sure that you can get the contingent beneficiary who now has a current interest to get them paid. Um, and one, I think, really important aspect to think about when, when you're looking at doing a mediation, settling a case, and even giving notice of a trust petition is 
do we give notice to contingent remainder beneficiaries, even unborn contingent remainder beneficiaries? Does this does Roth v. Jelly require then that in every case in which you have, which is almost every case, uh, the potential to having grandchildren that are born after the decedent uh, dies, uh, do you need to have a guardian ad litem appointed to represent the interests of those kids? So Roth v. Jelly is really, really a frightening one, and it it it's I think that. Uh, fiduciaries and their attorneys need to be sure they err on the side of caution and just give notice to everybody when you're going out to a mediation. Uh, Jeff, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean these are these are always our challenges, right? Making sure that when we do something, it is the final, you know, it is the final piece of what we're doing, and that we don't have somebody coming back years later and trying to to figure out how to undo it. So I, I would say that you know, as a fiduciary, it's important that we look at any party that could potentially have a claim to, to the rights of what's going on and, and making sure that they are included in the process. You know, obviously, one way to, to help prevent these issues is by hiring good, competent counsel who will assist uh, in making sure that everybody who needs to be noticed gets noticed and that, uh, you know, the process that you, you know, that you are going to pursue is one that will meet the requirements to prevent things like this from happening in the future. Uh, you know, the last thing you want to have to do is try to remember something that happened 20 years prior, you know, when you're called to testify either in a deposition or in a, in a trial uh, as to what happened and why it is that you neglected to include certain parties and what it is you did. And so, you know, making sure that good counsel, I think, is, is the key there to making sure that you don't you don't have these incidents happen and that make sure that they are up to date on the law, you know, as it relates to the different parties and how they their rights could be affected, you know, in your case. All right, so uh, I'll, I'll move on to the second uh, uh, area that I wanted to talk about with mediation, which is the Breslin case. And this is another case that came out a couple of years ago, which has been sort of um, earth shattering for a couple of reasons. And in Breslin, I like the facts of Breslin because um, it involved a former client of mine, the Pacific Pacific Legal Foundation. Uh, so what happened in Breslin is that Seton dies um, and he doesn't have any children. He's not married. He has a trust. And the trust says, I want to leave my fortune, which was substantial, to the charities listed on Exhibit A. And nobody could find Exhibit A. But in the binder for his trust was in the pocket in the flap, there was a handwritten note which had a list of charities about half a dozen or so charities and percentages written by their name. So the trustee filed a petition for instructions with the Superior Court and requested that the court instruct that that uh, handwritten note be considered the uh, Exhibit A for the purposes of distribution. Many of the charities participate in the litigation. The Pacific Legal Foundation elects not to file objections to the petition for instruction. The court then orders all the parties to go to mediation, and this was sort of, um, I think, novel because in the 25 years that I've been practicing, courts would always say, I can't order you to mediation. You can't. There's a, a, a um, access to justice issue there with because you're requiring people to pay for a private mediation, which is can be very expensive. Um, but the court ordered the parties to attend a mediation and ordered the trustee to give notice of all of the potential beneficiaries. And the notice said that if you do not show up, your interest may be impacted. So they hold the mediation. Once again, the Pacific Legal Foundation and a couple of other beneficiaries do not show up. The beneficiaries that show up settle the case and do not include the beneficiaries that do not show up. They split the pie between themselves. Kind of a long day to be yeah. And then they uh, uh, filed a, uh, I'm sorry, somebody is not on mute. Um, they filed a petition to approve the settlement agreement. Um, and then the Pacific Legal Foundation objected. Uh, and the court ruled, no, you were ordered to mediation. Your interest has been impacted. You were given notice of it and therefore you do not have standing. You're not a party to this lawsuit. You do not have standing to object to the settlement agreement. And 
upheld the settlement agreement that did not include the other beneficiaries. And so now it has become a very common practice for a court to order that a so-called Breslin notice be served on all parties, because if somebody elects not to show up to the mediation, their interests could be completely uh, um, obliterated by whatever is agreed upon in the settlement agreement. Uh, so this is a very powerful case. It's actually, I think, is, is, is helpful. I, I've done a number of mediations recently where somebody has said, I don't want to invite that party. They shouldn't have a seat at the table. And that's not the right approach. I think the right approach is get everybody involved in the mediation, send out a notice, invite them to it. And then if they don't show up, you can go ahead and settle around them. Um, it's very powerful. There's also another, uh, just a personal uh, uh, message that I like to take from the Breslin case, which is this probably would not have happened had the uh, Pacific Legal Foundation gotten not gotten a new attorney for that. I'm not bitter. Uh, so that's th those are the two major cases that have affected mediation and settlement. Um, Todd or Jeff, do you want to end, add anything to that? I'm good, Jeff. No, I mean, I, I, you know, again, it goes back to making sure you have the right parties, you know, there, and and it's better to be over inclusive than under inclusive. And I know that that's not a popular opinion because people. You know, it, because it becomes more difficult, the more people you have, and, and there are certain parties that are going to be more difficult to deal with just in general. And so the uh, the inclination would be to not include them, you know, unless you felt like you absolutely had to. But I, you know, I think that these, you know, these types of cases in, in Breslin specifically, you know, really show that that is the wrong, um, wrong approach to take and really being over inclusive, knowing that it's likely that, you know, oftentimes these parties won't show up. And then if they don't show up, then that at least gives you cover to the fact that they were invited, they knew about it, and they chose not to participate voluntarily. Okay, thank you, Jeff. So we'll go to hypothetical uh, number four, I guess. Uh, Troy, you want to read this one? Yeah, will do. John and Wanda have two children, Michael and Nancy. Michael has been estranged from the family for decades. John and Wanda draft a trust that, after the death of the surviving spouse, leaves everything to Nancy. The successor is, of course, a professional fiduciary. The trust specifically states that Michael is disinherited because of his estrangement. After John and Wanda die, the fiduciary serves a notice under probate code 1606 1.7. Within the 120 days, Michael files a trust contest. Can the fiduciary get involved in this case and defend the trust at the trust's expense? And if you're uh, prepared to have your mind blown here, this is a little known fact. The answer is, in most cases, no. The fiduciary cannot do that. A trustee has a duty of impartiality, and so they cannot get involved in a litigation on behalf of one set of beneficiaries against another set of beneficiaries, um, unless there is very specific language in the trust. And the courts have made clear that the general language that a trustee can uh, hire a, a, an attorney and uh, be involved in litigation does not cut it. Uh, what you have to have was uh, in, described in the Doolittle versus Exchange Bank case. In that case, we had in, in the Whittlesey case, that was a case where it was a beneficiary who was also a trustee. And so there was also that conflict of interest. In Doolittle, you had Exchange Bank, who was a corporate trustee that was defending the lawsuit. And in that case, they had a trust that had language that said, the trustee is hereby directed to defend at the expense of any trust estate governed by this agreement, any contest or other attack of any nature on this agreement, on any of its provisions and any amendments thereto, blah, 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 blah. So it specifically said any contest and specifically said that they could use, it, they could defend this at the expense of the trust. Um, having that language. So if if you are a fiduciary and there is a, uh, a challenge that is filed, it's very important for you to read the trust very carefully and make sure that you have language that is that specific before you get involved. And this is sort of counterintuitive because as a trustee, you would think it's my job to protect the intent of the trustor. And so it's your job to defend that document. The courts say, 
no, that's not really your job. Your job is to be impartial between the beneficiaries and not to take a stand on that. And this can have very dire consequences because if you go to the next slide, Todd, um, there was a recent case that came out just this year, Zen Luter versus Mueller, in which a trustee got involved in the action and did defend the trust amendment that was being contested and the court ruled that they did not have the ability to do so. And in that case, that trustee was protecting the interest of their own children in there. So there was also a conflict on top of that. And the court required the trustee, surcharged the trustee, and required the trustee to reimburse all of the attorney's fees that were expended uh, in defense of that action. Uh, so it's really, I can't emphasize this enough, really, really important for you to check the language of a trust before you get involved in any will contest or trust contest. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I want to uh, um, kind of move away from the actual presentation for a second and talk about an example that as, as Troy was talking about uh, Zahn Luter, jogged my memory from a month ago, during this presentation we made to, uh, to the PFAC at the PFAC conference, that after the event, I think we, I think we received 10, 11, maybe 12 calls, inquiries, or questions about uh, the example of the sale that we did um, a number of years ago. Uh, and, um, this was really specifically about um, an estate where there were uh, multiple sides of a family that owned. Uh, this was a uh, was brought to us by a litigation, uh, a litigating attorney uh, or litigation attorney who engaged us and wanted to us to auction assets of uh, a privately held company as well as. Uh, real estate and uh, a uh, private jet, a boat, and so on. Jeff and and Troy will um, uh, will remember this. Anyway, um, the reason I bring this up is I got so much, uh, so many questions about it after the conference. I thought I'd bring it he up here only because the the process of sale was something that was very much out of the box. And I think the really part of this presentation today is about being out of the box, thinking out of the box uh, in trying to solve your problem. And that's what Jeff does so well. Uh, that's what Troy does so well. And, and all of you as professionals, you try to think about what are your options? What do you have? What tools in your tool belt can you use to make this an effective uh, result? Uh, whatever the problem is, how do you find the solution? And in that case, just real quickly, that uh, client came to us to actually between about 50 family members uh, and related business associates, it was kind of, I think I used the example of the Hatfield versus the McCoys, um, that owned uh, or had the, wanted to buy all these uh, assets, they came to us to do evaluation and initially, and I said, well, you don't, may not want to do that. Maybe an auction is a better approach. Uh, and I was really thinking purely only about the real estate. And he said, well, I want to do that for the privately held shares of the company. And this was a, you know, about a $500 million privately held company that there were A and B shares that um, family members and, you know, again, both sides of families wanted to buy. And I said, well, we've never done such a thing, and I don't even know if we're capable of doing it, and I don't know how the results would be, and I'm not sure it would really work. Well, the attorney said, I know it'll work. I know you'll know what to do because you guys do a lot of very specialized structured sales and so on. Long story short, um, we, we, we ultimately, we uh, had a private auction between about, well, as technically, I think it was about 40-some family members and their attorneys and so on and so forth. And in this private auction, we were selling uh, a couple of homes, uh, 
upstairs in a um, corporate jet, a very big uh, uh, boat, a luxury cruiser down to Newport Beach, uh, and A and B shares in this privately held company. And they did not want this to be a public sale because this is a very closely held company and they did not want outside parties as buyers of the shares of which there would have been many, many, many. Uh, and actually I think it would have bumped the price up even higher. But ultimately we put a, a marketing package together as if we were going to market, but only to these 40 or so family members. And we did a, a an auction, a live auction at, in a conference room, a very big one, and there were all these different people that hadn't been together for decades in some cases, and others uh, that didn't even want to be in the same room. And we ran this auction, and uh, and this auction was live. It was in front. It was uh, it was what we call an open outcry auction, and I was the auctioneer, and ultimately auctioned off all these different interests. And the end result was. Uh, everybody got to either collude or buy what they wanted. They wanted, they were able to each see what everybody else was bidding. And the end result was everybody felt, felt it was fair and equitable. And I use those words fair and equitable because as Jeff gets involved with, I think he'll, he'll want to chime in about equality and transparency. And as such, this process, as I said, I was a negative Nelly at the beginning. And in the end, I stood there and and I got people coming up to me having, oh, this was so much fun. What a great result. I couldn't believe how great it went. I bought what I wanted. Oh, I didn't buy this, but he bought it. And there were people laughing and talking to each other that hadn't done so for 30 years. And, and the attorney said to me, well, that I knew this was going to work. And it resolved itself in a way that valuation could never get there. Mm -hmm. So I'm only bringing this up. And Jeff, you can chime in really just to the point that you want to think out of the box when it comes to selling, right? You have many options, be it partition, be it overbid, be it, be it in court, right? Jeff, anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, you know, as a fiduciary, you know, having us involved in the case comes at a cost, right? I mean, we, you know, we bill for our time and we expect it to get paid for the work that we do. So as part of that, you know, we need to bring value to, you know, to the to the case that we're working on. And one of the ways we can do that is by thinking outside of the box. I mean, we really need to understand, you know, who is it that we're looking to benefit here? Because, you know, as Todd said, this is not a traditional way you would ever do one of these sales because they could have gotten a lot more, you know, for these these privately held shares on the on the public market than yeah. they did doing it the way they did it. However, all the parties who were involved who would benefit from these sales agreed that that's not what they wanted. What they wanted was to, to you know, to, to go to the family and be, you know, and, and the bidding process to happen within, you know, that small group. And, and so it doesn't make sense then to try to overrule those wishes to go out and get more money for people who didn't want more money, you know. And so at the end of the day, the beneficiaries are the ones that, you know, are, are the ones that really should have, you know, some, you know, some say, or at least should guide your, you know, your actions in these cases to help, you know, really do what it is that they want out of the, out of these cases. You know, it's really hard because sometimes as a fiduciary, we want to get, do, you know, get in and just do the best we possibly can, you know, and forgetting about who it is that we're trying to benefit or who it is that we're really here to, to, to look after. And so we just need to make sure that we continue to focus on who it is that, you know, is the beneficiary, what it is that they want out of the case, and then thinking about unique ways to get there. I, I mean, there's not a lot of companies that would have even attempted what Todd, it, you know, Todd suggested there. But yet, when he was done, the parties were thrilled by what had happened. Oh. You know, and, and it actually brought them together, whereas they had not been, you know, had, had really not wanted to be in the same room with each other. But yet, you know, they they did. It accomplished what they wanted. They were all thrilled with the outcome. And at the end of the day, that was a big win-win for that case. Uh, th thanks, Jeff. Um, we're, I know we're getting to the top of the hour. Um, does anybody uh, have any questions? I know your mics are on mute. Uh, if you want to unmute and just ask a question in the open or via the chat room, you're more than welcome to do so. Um, if, you, if there's anything that comes to mind on any of these topics, um, Troy being the expert attorney here could probably answer some of those. Um, uh, but, but, you know, I think w one of the other things that 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 we're seeing in general um, when it comes into, I mean, I'm now I'm speaking about uh, either valuation or sale of 
for most of you, it's going to be real estate, I think. Uh, what we're seeing is with the values declining or pressure on pricing and it becoming a buyer's market, we are definitely seeing more litigation. We're seeing more argue, arguments between parties. We're seeing, um, I would say, more stress in the system with beneficiaries and family members and so on, just because you know prices aren't going up like crazy. And and you know uh, it was a seller's market. Now it's the inverse. And so now people are starting to get scared, worried, uh, stressed. Um, you know. One one interesting fact, uh, before prior to about a year ago, um, most of our real estate auctions, I would say 95% of our real estate auctions throughout the U.S. were not distressed. They were not done for a lender in any form. They were not done in the bankruptcy uh, matter. Now, from a 95%, 5%, we're now probably a 80-20. So um, more distress, but still 80% of the clients we're auctioning real estate for are we're doing it purely because they want a certainty and they want immediacy and they want to circumvent um, in many situations, uh, as I alluded to before, going in and out of escrow with the buyer uh, for all kinds of uh, nonsensical reasons. So. We're seeing a change in the marketplace, and this could be, you know, a, a five or six or seven or ten million dollar luxury home. It could be land. It could be an industrial building we're doing. It could be some shopping centers we're working on. It, it, it's it's quite broad. But I just thought you all would like to know that because every day I'm asked, what are we seeing in the marketplace? And obviously, it's relative to what we're selling and where we're selling it, uh, and that will vary. Uh, we just sold two homes in. Uh, the uh, Corona Del Mar Newport Beach market of California. And, you know, I think we had 33 offers on one of them. So, you know, in that case, uh, just, you know, very, you know, very vibrant, very uh, liquid, liquid market. In other cases, that's not, the, that's not the situation. Um, so no questions from anybody. Jeff, I'll start with you. In closing, is there anything you'd like to add uh, to everybody? And then I'll go to Troy for everybody. Really, I would just you know point out again that you know it, you know if you choose to take these roles that you know you take them seriously that you evaluate the whole circumstance that you're working in. Uh, if it's outside of your area of expertise, go out and hire the person who is the expert in that area because they will more than pay for themselves in in this process. You know the people that you hire, make sure that they are experienced in what it is that they say they do. Make sure that they have the credentials to back it up. And at the end of the day, you know, make sure they're prepared to, to go to trial if necessary and to be able to defend what it is that they've said and recommended. Yeah, thank you very much. Troy, how about you? Uh, well, what Jeff said is uh, was, was very well said. Um, I don't really have anything to add. Okay. Well, everybody, our next fiduciary education form will be towards the end of August. Um, and the topics will be on more of construction and liability of disclosure and issues regarding real estate. Uh, and I've got uh, a couple of great speakers on that topic. I'm looking forward for that event. Uh, we'll send out invitations. Um, and um, thank you all for, for joining us for this uh, uh, July 2023 Fiduciary Education Forum event on partition sales. And, we look to uh, see you all soon and at uh, hopefully at our next month's um, event. And um, thank you very much. Have a, uh, have a good rest of the uh, uh, July and part of your summer vacation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jeff, for participating. Thank you very much, Troy. And everyone, uh, any questions, we will send. Um, uh, if you want the presentation, just email me and we'll send it off to you so you have it in your file. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Troy. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everyone.